is a glass. We got Rip Rawlings in the house. Yeah, there he is. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Good to see you. Great seeing you, brother. Hey, uh, yeah. you are a New York Times and U.S. Today best-selling author. Congrats. Thank you. With this you guys Assault by Fire is your first solo thriller. It Why don't is. you give everyone a little background or maybe a okay. little bit of a tease on the story? Yeah. So <clears throat> the, the premise actually was born from, from kind of sitting around in the Pentagon and reading probably too many pieces of other people's dirty mail, you know, it's that we have a tendency, I think, in the United States to believe that we're invulnerable from outside attack. And of course, we've been attacked before. So we tend to kind of forget our own history and, and we don't really realize, yeah, we're vulnerable. So the premise really is, when are we the most vulnerable? When is the United States at a position or in a spot where things really could go awry? if someone wanted to. And there are folks obviously on the world stage from, from Russia and China that uh, really don't like us very much. I mean, you don't need to look much past the last election to see that. But um, they also, I think, have a tendency to jockey for position. And they watch us very carefully. I mean, if you're the biggest guy on the block, if you're the best uh, ball player on the team, everybody watches you. And, and they're looking specifically for weakness. I think it's yeah. just a human trait to look for weakness. So in the book, we posit three different weaknesses. Um, and they're really not very difficult to see, but they are very apparent to our enemies. One is if you are able to neutralize our strategic nuclear advantage, which you would think would be impossible to do, it's a long range missile system, it can really hurt. Um, if you're able to find a way to neutralize that, then by gosh, you know, you're, you can do some damage. So there is a, Russian general, I'm sure we'll talk about him in the book, who has the duty of kind of figuring out what are these three, what are these disadvantages that America has? You know, give me a plan, as we do all the time. We're war planning constantly, as is Russia. And he comes up with these three things. One is we can neutralize the American strategic nuclear capability by moving in close with tactical nukes. He says, um, you know, we've got the ability to, uh, to, if we can find a way to cripple the Second Amendment or get America to stop handing out weapons, uh, you know, to everybody, or at least find some way to, to lessen that, then we've got less of a, a counterinsurgency fight kind of on the back end of any invasion. Um, and uh, the, the third thing is they say, oh, what is the third thing? I just forgot. We got nukes. Mm, help me out. Didn't you guys read the book? Yeah. Something <laughs> about, was it, is it the uh, naval capacity? Naval capacity, well, it's the oceans. I mean, part of it is, is that as a hegemony, you look across the oceans and it's difficult right. to, to pass our for, Our forces were overseas. Oh, forces deployed. Yeah, of course, yeah. forces deployed. So, yeah, the third, the third right item really is that, you know, this, part of this came about from looking at ourselves. We did a lot of red teaming during the, the, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. We deployed a considerable amount of our active duty forces and reserve forces. And it's not a unending spigot. I mean, if you deploy active duty forces, your less ready forces are in the hamper. If you don't have money to, to get them kind of back to full strength, they're not what you think they are. On paper, they exist, but these are guys, especially in the reserves that are out, you know, in business, uh, working on Wall Street, you know, whatever it might be, uh, they're not sitting ready for something to happen. So we become exceedingly vulnerable when our active duty forces depart. So anyways, in the book, you've got this kind of conglomerate of, of things that happen and Russia sees the opportunity and says, let's pounce. And uh, you know, the wrong guy, I guess, or, or the right guy from the Russian perspective is at the helm and it looks like the right thing to do. So they say, we can do this. And by the way, America is a threat and there's really only one way to deal with it. And that's an invasion. Mm. Gotcha. Well, speaking of threats, threats rise and fall over the generations. And uh, yeah. now a few decades after the end of the Cold War, Russia is kind of front and center in a lot of people's minds now. Yeah. But what specifically over the last two books and your collaboration with Mark and then this solo book, what specifically brought to Rip Rollins' mind that the Russians um, are, are the most prominent threat? So it's, that's a good question. So the first, the first thing is the so you go through capability and will, right? So the two things that you kind of want to see from an opponent is, do they have the capability to do something to us? And number two, is there a willpower there? In the past six years, so it actually goes kind of well back before where I see the Russians doing it in the book even, Russia has started this campaign, and it's not merely kind of the cult of Putin, but they've started this campaign of self-excellence. And 
it's interesting because you can see it in places that you wouldn't expect. So they now have these very good movies out about their heroics in World War II. It's chest beating type stuff. Mm -hmm. The amount of novels and books that are being produced in Russia that are patriotic towards kind of almost Soviet days. I mean, they look at the Soviet days with, uh, and through kind of like, you know, rose colored lenses, they see it as the halcyon days of their, of their culture. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> this resurgence is, uh, it's not just a wellspring, this is a tsunami. There is a whole culture in Russia right now that is exceedingly patriotic. And they're being fanned, or the flames are being fanned, uh, by these books and movies. And so can you say it comes from the top and that Putin is directing it? I'm not sure that he is 100%, but certainly the sentiment, the air of we're great and we need to be the number one superpower in the world stems from him. So mm -hmm. there is a bit of that. But uh, Russia, when you see that happen, I mean, the last time we really saw that happen was during the Cold War. And then the time we saw that uh, before that was uh, obviously just during World War II. So these very, very patriotic movements, in my mind, throughout history, hearken, uh, you know, big actions on the world stage. Hmm. Well, I have a quick follow up on that. Um, since we've kind of been through this dance with the Cold War, are, yeah. you, are you concerned that maybe some of the lessons that they've learned some lessons from the last time around that? that oh, are you got it. No, I mean, Sean, you're right on it. So, not only have they learned lessons, but they are <clears throat> in a lot of ways ahead of us on some of those lessons. Hmm. I mean, you know, the most, I think the most elusive are things that are cyber. So it's very hard for us to calculate what did they do and what is their purpose. But look at the amount of tactical nuclear weapons that they've stockpiled. We have virtually none. Okay, so we, we got rid of them. We said tactical nukes are not important to us. Maintaining them, frankly, was too hard. And so we erred on the side of strategic nuclear weapons, and we've been reducing those. People are kind of lost the visibility on it, but we've reduced strategic nuclear weapons um, egregiously over the past, you know, 10 or 12 years. Um, and I mean, you know, what is a good counterbalance of nuclear force? I mean, that's, I'll leave that up to the people who, who debate that on a daily basis. But we've certainly taken our stockpiles down to about 10 to 15 percent of where they were in its heyday. And uh, even in recent years, you know, we've reduced our stocks by uh, 33 percent. Russia has done like. So they've done a, a, you know, counter or reciprocal reductions. So on the world stage, they look, you know, very magnanimous. But tactical nuclear weapons, they've done nothing with. They don't even, there's no accounting. And they've maintained them. And we believe mm -hmm. that they've done that for one primary purpose, which is to keep the doors to Europe open. But that's where I twisted a little bit in the book and said, well, kind of the way that we deal with artillery and combat. I mean, the Viet Cong, um, you know, the Germans, every country that we fought have dealt with massive amounts of American artillery or close air support. And so their tactic has always been to get very close. The, uh, you know, Ho Chi Minh, uh, General Nguyen Gap, you know, propagated that belief and said, hug their artillery. Yeah. Um, because if you get too close, their biggest advantage is gone. And now it's tay tay Now it's you versus him. And who's the better shot? Let's find out. So that's what happens kind of on a much more strategic scale is that the Russians take the tactical nuclear weapons and bring them up to our coast and say, hey, I'm going to neutralize your strategic artillery, so to speak, and I'm going to uh, get in right close and then hit you with tactical nuclear weapons that go completely below the radar. Oof. The other thing is, I think, um, you know, we've had our, our forces out there on the field for 20 years now or just yeah. about. Yeah. Everyone's looking at our tactics. It's in the open. They can see how we're communicating, how we move our, our units and stuff. And so we're yeah. being studied. We are being studied. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. I, it's one of the greatest advantages of fielding your forces is that they get exercise. And I don't mean to sound septic in that. Obviously, going to war is nothing trivial. So when we send boys downrange, men and women downrange, it's a complicated affair. Uh, obviously, we've all dealt with those tragedies. It's not a good thing necessarily for the country. But it does do one thing. You know, if you were Julius Caesar or General Patton, it wouldn't matter. Both of you would say getting your field armies in the field is what keeps your armies practiced and ready to go. And you bring back veterans and the veterans kind of re-engage and re-energize uh, how you do war. But the big problem is you're in a fishbowl the whole time you do it. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. every other nation is going, aha, 
they did this, so let's do this next time, and they won't be able to do it. Or they just simply watch the enemy and say, hmm. But it's like 50-yard line quarterbacking is that you get an opportunity that no one else does. You get to see it from, uh, from afar. And, and absolutely, Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran have been collecting on us. I mean, Iran and North Korea in person virtually. Iran, as you all know, we fought them on the battlefields. Uh, I can't tell you how many types of weapons that we took off what were erstwhile Quds forces directly from Iran. Yeah. So they're not only studying us, but they're actually engaging us, and they're doing it quite uh, quite well. Hmm. Well, Salt by Fire is <clears throat> your second novel, but it's really your yeah. first as, as a solo effort. That's um, right. What did you learn this time around uh, working on this on your own versus your first, uh, which was with Mark Graney? <laughs> well, Mark's such a great mentor. I learned that the training wheels are off. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, whereas with, with Red Metal, I could always go to a willing shoulder to cry on and say, hey, Mark, you know, I'm working on this chapter. You know, what's your advice uh, on this one? You know, besides maybe calling my mom, who's got no sympathy. Uh, yeah. It, it, you know, and it's funny because you kind of expect your spouse or somebody else to help out. And, you know, no one has time to listen to you ramble on about chapter this or chapter that. But uh, I don't know. I will say, though, when I got to a certain point, it was a pleasure to give some draft chapters to close buddies mm -hmm. and get their feedback on things. And, you know, so, you know, I guess maybe having worked, especially with a senior writer like Mark, you get this, um, you don't have an immunity to to listening to that kind of criticism. You 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 kind of want it. You want to hear people say, here's something I, that, and they see something in your writing that, that you didn't. So I got that from Mark. And in this case, I had to kind of supplant it a little bit with buddies and, and family a little bit and give them a chapter here, a chapter there and say, what do you think of this character? Did I build him or her the right way? Mm, okay. Well, Assault by Fire reminded me of one of my all time favorite movies, Red Dawn. Yeah. Awesome. The, the original Red Dawn. <laughs> I'm you know, glad to Patrick, hear it. Yeah. Patrick Swayze, Charlie Sheen. Uh, it carries yeah. very similar themes. And yeah. you know, obviously a very similar enemy. Um, yeah. And if you ask any red-blooded American man about our age, they probably loved Red Dawn too. Yeah. So I'm curious, did you, draw any, did you draw any inspiration from Red Dawn? Absolutely. Yeah. I, in fact, there was, I rewrote the first seven chapters partly because of Red Dawn. Hmm. Um, so I hadn't seen the movie in years. Of course, I remembered it, um, you know, and, and, that if you're invading America in the modern era, you know, that's not a bad movie to go back and look at just because it gives uh, some of that, that clout, some of the toughness that uh, you would expect to get from civilians in, in that kind of a fight. But the, the book, when I first started it, I had, I've saved the chapters and I'll eke out a little bit later on in other books, but it was very technical. It got into the background. I discussed the strategic aspects of what Russia was up to and, Honestly, I chopped seven chapters out of it because I went back and watched Red Dawn. Red Dawn has this wonderful beginning where they go, 1983, wheat harvests worst in 10 years. You know, I don't remember exactly, so I'll paraphrase, but it was yeah. uh, war in Ukraine bogs down Russian forces. Um, you know, Cuba invades Mexico. And it's mm -hmm. very quick. And then the next thing you know is you have paratroopers dropping in on a high school. And it's like, hey, man, game on. And I think that's what made it a good movie is that you, you're in the action pretty quickly. So I, I wiped out seven chapters. I've already heard about it from a couple kind of armchair strategists who said, you know, you kind of glaze over what's going on. So, yeah, I, I actually mapped out all of that. But then I took it out because it just doesn't do anything to make for a fun story. And ultimately... You know, that's what I'm getting paid to do is telephone yarn. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Freaking mission accomplished there, yeah. big brother. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. Appreciate it. We talked a little bit about this, but one of the fundamental differences between Red Metal and Assault by Fire is that your novel takes place mostly on American soil. Right. This is, I guess, kind of more of an emotional question in a way, but did it feel yeah. more immediate to write scenes taking place on the U.S. soil? Yeah. So... So I'm going to answer that this way, because everybody I've asked who's read a draft, even of a couple of chapters, have had kind of some similar reactions, which they've always said, you know, when I saw Red, Red Dawn or whatever, and because we've all imagined ourselves as the kids in the high school in Red Dawn, or hopefully in the book as, you know, one of the civilians or one of the soldiers in the book, is that you, 
you know, what, what if, what happens, what do we do if we're invaded? And so, you know, I think if you look at it from that perspective, it is emotional. If we're invaded and outside of it, I mean, we can, we can tolerate yelling at each other. We can tolerate, you know, getting angry. Our politics are, are, have always been very, very uh, visceral. We've always been uh, good at shouting. Between us chickens, I think that's really what the Greeks intended, which is a robust debate is, is very important, even if it gets to some civil disobedience. But, um, you know, then all of a sudden an outside invader comes knocking, and I think all of a sudden all bets are off. We've proven that before, is that immediately we go, oh, hell no. You know, and it's kind of a family tribe thing. I think it's, it's yeah. like, you know, I don't, I don't care what you look like or who you are or what your background is or what your religion is, but that guy sure as hell isn't coming in here. So <laughs> let's do something about it because that son of a bitch is going to, you know, I'm not going to let him take my, you know, we, we'll pay the tax collector all sorts of stuff. But if, if the Ruskies come in and say they're going to input, well, hell no, you mean, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm going to freaking take this guy out. So, uh, but yeah, I, I, I liken it, Rip, I liken it to, yeah. uh, uh, you know, you're talking about like the political the political divide. Like, yeah. no, I get to punch that guy in the face. Yeah, you I get, get to wait, punch wait, him yeah. in the face. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and you see it among brothers and sisters a lot. If you've got a pack of, I don't know, two or three brothers, yeah, and you, the brothers fight like, you know, like bears in a den. And then all of a sudden, an outside couple wolves come in and all the brothers are like, oh, hell no. <laughs> gonna do something else. So yeah, I mean, if you were going to paraphrase the entire book, it would be that, oh, hell no. <laughs> that's, that's kind of the whole book in a, in a nutshell. Uh, when you were developing the assault plan, or the pl- actually right. assault plan, the, the plot to Assault by Fire, how much real world intel um, did you sit through considering the Russian attack on our home soil? Did you, did, did you have, you know, the entirety of the plan thought out? Yeah. So them? it's, there's a, there's a, when I was in the Pentagon, I was one of my positions. So I was the strategic planner for the Pacific when I was uh, with the Marine Corps in the Pentagon. Okay. But it's one of these things that if you do, I mean, it's the same in any profession. It's not just the military, but if you do really well on something, I like to think I did well. I mean, my boss has told me so, so I believe him. But if you do really well, they kind of reward you with more work. Right? It's like, <laughs> yeah. hey, you finished all that stuff, so here's a lot of other stuff. Um, so I was doing that constantly, and they said, hey, uh, congratulations, you're now the nuclear officer for the Marine Corps. Oh, I was like, what? We don't. There are no nukes. We don't have any in our arsenal. And they're like, yeah, you got to go sit on all the boards and panels and, you know, and that kind of stuff. Well, within a week, I'm reading through TS, top secret compartmented information to kind of get smart on my job. I'm going, oh, my God. You know, there's a lot going on that I didn't know is just a Marine reconnaissance officer. Uh, But, you know, there's a lot of equity in here for the service. I mean, we fly the president around on HMX-1, which is the equivalent mm-hmm. of Air Force One, it's a helicopter. And so we have duties to ensure that he has communications and the ability to call the people he needs to. Now, the other big part was um, the commandant of the Marine Corps, well, every service secretary, ha- every service chief has to stand in for the secretary of defense if he can't be found during uh, a nuclear crisis. So. In the military, you know, every officer, every enlisted man stands watch or stands post sometimes in their career. They have to, you know, learn what they need to do, what are the limits of their post, carry a pistol, you know, but you're going to stand post no matter what sometime in your service. This is the equivalent of the generals, the four stars standing post is that for all of the four service secretaries, they stand in for three months out of the year. And they now are the secretary of defense should the nuclear balloon go up. So my job was to train the commandant uh, on everything, on how does he perform his duties to contact the president and inform him, sir, this is the commandant of the Marine Corps, I'm the stand-in, the Secretary of Defense could not be found. Uh, We have been shot at with a nuclear uh, capability and uh, here are my recommended actions. So I would, you can imagine the bubble around that, the spheres of things I had to learn yeah. became very, very, very broad. So t- to answer your question, finally, <laughs> yeah, I had a lot of these things in the back of my mind because I saw them and did them. And then you kind of realize how fractious and fragile our empire is. You tend to think that, you know, we live in this kind of nice nuclear bubble and the, the Pax Americana or the Pax, the nuclear Pax, the, the piece of, of, you know, mutually assured destruction is very fragile. And 
in some regard, it doesn't exist if you can find a way to neutralize it. And that's, that's what I did in the book. Hmm. Also in the book, you use a whole bunch of maps. Um, <laughs> I did, yeah. Mich- Michelin maps, topographical yeah. maps. Like, yeah. I, I'm curious with all, with, with your experience in, um, you know, planning and red hatting stuff. Yeah. Do you, did you, uh, for, for your, there's a, there's a large ambush, like in about halfway in the middle of the book. Right. Did you have that drawdown on the maps? Did you have like I did. The, these yeah. are the moving pieces? <laughs> I did. I even I even have the maps and I asked to have them put in the book and my publisher looked at it and goes, This is really complicated. <laughs> and I'm like, Well, <laughs> yeah. He's like, I don't think anyone's gonna understand it. Can we just turn it into like this blue arrow and this red arrow? I'm like, No, just don't worry about it. You're it. Like these these <laughs> are the me- machine gun posts, like here. Yeah. Here. Yeah, and you know, you always have to figure out what's too much uh, for for your reader. Um, so hopefully, I had a good balance in there. I'm not sure that I did, but but you know, I also walk the ground. I mean, as a reconnaissance guy, my tendency is to really want to see things, and and the ground really comes alive. So that area in West Virginia, we're we're kind of temporarily living in right now. So with the kids, the school in Northern Virginia has all been closed down. So we oh, tell me about we've it. well, we're we're adopted West Virginians right now. So we're building a cabin up in the area kind of where the, the book takes place. Uh, I just got back from bear hunting up there uh, just a weekend ago nice. with the kids and everybody. But, uh, you know, we're making it a homestead. It's a, it's a beautiful place. The valleys and, and rivers and tributaries up there are absolutely stunning. And I mean, it's, a, it's a very picturesque place to have a battle. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So, so, yeah, I've walked over all that area. In fact, I've been hunting over that area quite a bit and it is, it is everything that I've said it is in the book. It's a fascinating area. It is a, it's a humble area, meaning, you know, you don't run into a, a lot of West Virginians that are, you know, working at high-tech computer firms, but you will not find nicer people, I think, on the face of the earth. Yeah, I lived in Charleston when I was a kid, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Beautiful, I, beautiful area. Yeah, for sure. I, I always, my family's, well, on my dad's side's from the South. And um, when I was a kid, actually, when we were younger, my dad said, you will never speak with a Southern accent because everybody will treat you like an idiot. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we we lost our Southern accents early, but I could feel it coming back up in the hills in West Virginia. Yeah. It peaked yeah. out and everyone's like, oh, where are you from? And I'm like, oh, I'm from the Tidewater down in Norfolk. And they're like, oh. And then my wife's like, where did that come from? Like, <laughs> Dad told me not to do that. Got to survive, flared. <laughs> well, it's you know, it's still there. It's I, all of my cousins. Every time we go back for our summer reunion, we were the the cousins who, you know, even though we kind of moved around a lot, we moved out west, which to them was like moving across the Mason Dixon. They're like, yeah, what what happened? Where is your accent? Where are you got? Who are you guys? We're like, well. We're Coloradans now. You're one of them now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah My wife yeah. always tells me when when I, we go back and visit family in New Jersey, she's like, all of a sudden you sound very New Jerseyan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what does that? I just mean? don't want to do. I don't want to be like Madonna, where all of a sudden I like this British accent. Yeah. Just pops <laughs> out and I was like, what? What are you doing? That's really but I, it's, wrong. Well, it's funny because even in our family, as much as we try to conceal the southernism aspects, you know, just verbiage and that kind of thing, we still say in the family, y'all and. There's a lot of those things, but my grandmother and grandparent, my, both my grandparents on my dad's side had the most beautiful Southern accents you've ever heard. My grandmother spoke with that kind of syrupy, you know, uh, deep Southern drawl. She'd say, well, Rip, isn't it wonderful to see you? You know how everything is drawn out like a mint julep on a Sunday yeah. on the porch, you know, in, in, in May in, in the Savannah. So, I don't know. I grew up with all that. And it's funny because every time I go back for our family unions, it's all there. And it's, it's in some ways, you know, that's a, uh, it's a bygone era. Cause that accent, I don't, I don't hear that anymore. The way that my grandparents spoke. Yeah. True. Yeah. Circling back to the book, Tice Asher. Get back to the book. <laughs> yeah. He, he's not your typical thriller hero. And, and that's, yeah. that's because he's, he's disabled, but his disability doesn't, uh, doesn't necessarily make him any less lethal or any less no. cunning. Can That's you tell right. us who or what sparked the idea of crafting him as your protagonist? Well, I've, I've had a lot of wounded warrior buddies, first of all, and in some ways they become more capable than the rest of us. I mean, it's interesting to note that all of the services tend to kind of, I'm going to use a derogatory term, kind of shit can their wounded. I mean, and, and I don't, all the services do, do a pretty good job trying to help out and make sure everyone gets recovered, but the, the first thing they try to do is offer wounded warriors kind of a pension and, and an out. 
and say, well, look, you know, you took one for the team. Why don't you go sit on the sideline? And a lot of cases, they don't want that. A lot of the cases, they say, hell no, I'm at my prime. I may have lost a leg, as is the case with Tice Asher, but uh, I really want to do what I've signed up to do. And we don't always have good positions for them. So in some ways, the book was born from that also, which is what if we had wounded warriors who, you know, we did try to, to do the things that we know that they can do. But yeah, Tice gets his leg blown off very early in the book, so I'm not revealing anything there. But he, um, he then has to deal with the disability. So immediately he is called up in front of what's called a Naval Medical Board. And for my friends who've been through it and having seen them and been on them as a board member, they're awful. It's gut-wrenching, I think, for both sides. You as an officer presiding on the board are looking at a young man or woman who is dealing with something. And it's not always, you know, a disability, but in some cases it might be something, a trauma at home. And you're now having to determine, are they medically qualified to continue to do their duties? Yeah. More often than not, at the height of the war, we said no. And we said, look, we've got this wounded warrior regiment. Uh, we're going to stick it, you in it for a while to recover. But, you know, we're fighting a war, so we got to get back to the business of doing battle. So Tice is right in that, and he, he has this moment where he has to kind of fight the board in person. And the board is not all that understanding. They're pretty tough on him. And so he says, you know, keep me in, coach. Right. Well, and, and to follow up with that, have you – I mean, you were in, you were in the Corps long enough. Has, yeah. has the – has that process improved? Or? Monumentally. Monumentally, yeah. Okay. I, in fact, in some ways, you know, so I even made note of the book that it was around the 2006, 8, 10 time frame, you know, where we, so 2006, we started this upward trend of taking care of our winter better, 2008 again, and 2010 again. So we're on top of our game right now. And if you were, if you were wounded in combat, or if you <clears> are still wounded in combat, I think it's, now it's better than it's been in any other conflict in our time as a nation. Yeah, and I can't imagine how heart wrenching that is for somebody who still wants to serve active duty. And it's awful. Yeah, right. I had a corporal who was well. I won't mention any names, but he had his leg blown off. Uh, so in some ways, maybe he's a you know uh, an inspiration to the character. But um, he wouldn't quit. They gave him two legs. He was determined that they give him a running leg, you know, a racing blade, one of the yeah. curved blades, mm -hmm. as well as a regular prosthetic. And years later, he and I were stationed in the Pentagon together. So they gave him a lot of admin duties afterwards. Yeah. And he kicked my ass on runs. He would be like, <laughs> sir, he'd be, I mean, he'd at least twice a week, he'd be like, hey, sir, he'd come by the office because uh, we're both stationed in the Pentagon. He'd say, hey, sir, you want to go for a run? I'd be like, yeah, let's go. And we'd go out and he would just drill me. He'd put on this blade. And, but he was, phys he was fit as, as a fiddle. You know, here I am a guy, you know, pushing his mid-40s, you know, doing pencil stuff after being downrange for many years. I'm a broken man. And uh, he's, he's inspiring me on a, on a daily basis because uh, he's way more broken than I was. And he didn't let it affect him one whit. So, you know, I think not, it, the, the, it's the kids that we bring in oftentimes that, that overcome their disabilities just because they're that kind of kid, you know, they're, that, yeah. they're just, they're amazing inspirations to all of us to begin with. Something right. special. Yeah. Well, likewise, your antagonist, um, Kolikoff is a very, yeah. very fascinating guy. And, yeah. and one of the things that I like about it is that, you know, the he, villains are always heroes in their own stories if they're, yeah. like, if they're good villains. And he's, right. a, he's a patriot in his, in his, he is. um, yeah. what, how do you go about creating that guy? How do you go? Is he based on people you've interacted with or, or is just, well, a little bit. So, I mean, Kolokov's a little bit of a careerist. I mean, he really just, want, he's kind of very enthralled by his own advancement. Um, but he also hits this awful roadblock and it happens directly in the beginning of the book. And immediately in the beginning of the book, he's at the top of his game. He's a rising star. He's one of the Russia's youngest full bird colonels. And so he's like, this is it. He's given an office in uh, a terrific old palace, one of the old czar's palaces that's out in, um, uh, not to Leningrad, but uh, I'm forgetting my book scene. Ugh. Let me see. Mm -hmm. It's okay. the port city. Edit this out. Anyways, he's given this wonderful, <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's given this fantastic office, uh, you know, kind of overlooking the water. You can see the Fabergé Art Museum, uh, you know, and so he's like, this is it, man. And then he gets handed this, this next task. And the task is to take charge of their 
units, his headquarters uh, parade and, and what they're going to show for the May Day parade. And if you know anything about Russian history, May Day, the, the Victory Day, is the celebration of their victory over Nazi Germany. Right. And they really do believe that it, it was, if, if not for Russia, the world would have collapsed. So they have May Day parades like you've never seen before. And they, you know, Putin is out in front and he's doing the dictator wave and tanks are going by and missiles are going by. And, um, you know, so he's, he's put in charge of this. But then they tell him the biggest thing that they have right now is, is this computer. And he's like, well, what are you talking about? Like, well, we don't have anything. We've got a computer. And he said, well, let's march all the cooks and the bakers and the candlestick makers, but let's make something of it. Well, he's set to give a presentation about it, and obviously it flops, and then the next thing you know, he is not just fired, but he's sent to Siberia. Um, he assumes that that's it, and he's, he's kind of put up against the wall with a bunch of traitors. Uh, and his new boss does this kind of fake assassination on him to punk him out and see what he's worth, and then uh, takes the, the hood off of him and says, you work for me now, and I want to see what your computer can do. Mm-hmm. And... So this new boss, I think if you were to, you know, the, the new boss is named General Timken, and General Timken is one of these characters that I think we may have, all of us have probably encountered maybe once in our life. He is abjectly, abject evil. He just, he has no good qualities. He is there to push everybody to do things that he wants them to do, is very, very good at doing that. And so that, so Kolokov in some ways is a, a bit of a tragic figure. Hopefully most readers are kind of like, God, poor guy. Yeah. Because he, yeah, he's obviously the brains and he knows what to do, Kolokov, but uh, he's got this overlord who, mm. who truly knows how to make things work and is not going to stop. And he is, uh, like I said, you probably run into guys like that once in a lifetime where they, they're really, really good. They're very megalomaniacal. They know how to get people to do things for them. And in the right circumstances, you know, they end up like General Timken or, you know, the guys that we saw in, in Nazi Germany who were able to propel a nation to do things that, uh, you know, probably don't need to be done. Right. Well, can you can you talk a little bit about that that computer? Uh, yeah. Spetz Vieter? Like, what so, was yeah, that the all Spetz about? Forum. Well, the Spetz Forum is a special, it's, I'm going to, I'll mangle it in Russian, but Spetsnaya, Machina, Oh, I'm going to screw it up, but it's, it means special invasion calculating machine. So it's, uh, hmm. can you hear me? Yep. yep, yep, yep. yep. Oh, okay. Yep. Sorry. I thought I hit the button there. So it, it really, what it means is, is, and we have these also, and it's a, it's a tactical or sorry, an operational computer. And the intent is you hmm. put in variables, the Russian call them permanyaya, and it's, you, you let it, you test it to see what is within the realm of the possible for logistics, for, uh, you know, everything down to combat operations. We have a number of these. It's interesting to note that Russia has just purchased, I'm going to mess this up too, but so don't quote me exactly. I think it's 16 petaflop uh, computer. So if you think of, wow. you know, gigabytes and terabytes, and now you're That's up nice. to what are called yeah, peta, petaflops. So they just purchased one of the world's fastest computers, and it is going directly into... Uh, Moscow, and it will. It is basically this. The Spets Four. Its job is to is to calculate variables and how to win wars. Remarkably, they do very well. Again, the seven chapters I eliminated. I went into some little more detail on this thing. I'll eke it out in other books. But I mean, suffice to say, this thing is a supercomputer with Kolokov helping it, and you know the driven furor of uh, his boss, uh, General Timken. You have kind of a perfect storm of computer plus man plus leader. Um, so, so the computer itself, it has a portable element. So when they bring it over, when eventually the evasion happens, uh, Kolokov brings part of it with them mm-hmm. and it helps them determine what works and what doesn't by punching things into to the computer. Hmm. Well, w- since a lot of writers watch this show, we would be remiss in not asking at least one writing question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We've chatted in the past about your word count and how pissed off you make all of us. How you <laughs> crank out a few thousand words in your average writing day? Yeah, but what do you? They're think, not always good words. So yeah. yeah. What do you think the key is to being so prolific on a daily basis? Um, is it the ability to pause hmm. the internal editor, or is it something else? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, you know, I think 
part of it is is that you have a story that you can't it's just exploding to get out i mean i for me most of the time it's it's a volcano so it's it, i'm trying to put a tamper on it to try to stop some of it from coming out and when i sit down to write you know every aspect of it sort of seems to come alive in my mind so you know for me the most important process is the editing process because i put all of this stuff on page i get thousands and thousands of words put down and then i have to sift through what is entertaining and what's going to be fun in some cases it sounds great to me it's like wow i just explained the spets for computer and you know in 20 pages and then i look at it and go that that's really boring <laughs> i mean <laughs> how about one how about half of one yeah how about i take it all down and condense it into it's a really great computer and it can calculate invasion and then you know your readers got it the readers like i got it i mean you don't need to break down the science of how petaflops work uh, right. Just tell me that uh, there's a guy who's now in charge of a computer and it's calculating stuff. So I had it in the first edition, it, it, it calculated the invasion to the Ukraine and basically said, um, if you're going to invade the Ukraine, don't invade all of it, invade half of it. Because if you invade the whole thing, you incur the wrath of NATO. Right. But if you invade only half of it, the part that is, you know, considers itself Russian, no one will do anything. So in the, in the original version of the book, the computer made a calculation and uh, that was kind of Kolokov's ascension. But I, I'll still probably use that in the in a later version is that, you know, they they find reasons to get the computer to work before they put it to, to, to the test in, in the United States. And then it gets the attention of the president yeah. of Russia. Yeah. Right. I always I found it interesting where he actually placed that computer. Yeah. Oh. We, in, later on or in the, in the beginning? In the beginning. In the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't want to reasonable find that out, but it's <laughs> you'll find it out. Yeah. Hey, yeah, um, Kol Kolokov has to get into, yeah, he, Kolokov's entrance into, I mean, I guess we could, could should we get, can we get into that? Is that too much of a spoiler? Uh, it's an invasion. Everyone knows it's an invasion. <laughs> Everyone knows it's an invasion of America, but yeah, they end up in the Pentagon. They, the Russians mm -hmm. take over the Pentagon. Right. And Kolokov's entry into the Pentagon, I mean, he's a little bit of a desk jockey and he's got some rough riders with him. So he's got a special forces officer with him. And, uh, you know, there's blood and guts all around him. And on Kolokov, even though he's the mastermind of the computer, is I'm not sure he's really ready to see the damage that his, you know, military theorems have have brought about. Right. I mean, there's troop there's troops all around him who, who don't care. They're yeah. they're just glad to go kick some ass, and uh, mm -hmm. they're doing their jobs. And he's kind of sees and is like, oh my god, I'm the one who put this together. Yeah, you know, like the like the that American uh, soldier. Still with his glasses on, like in he the still corner. got his glasses. Yeah. yeah, and for some reason that really sickens him. He realizes he's a bureaucrat. I mean, it's basically him. You know, in mm -hmm. some ways, this is kind of like the Darth Vader thing, where you look in and then the what is it? Luke goes into the forest and the mask yeah. comes off, and it's him. Yeah, it's him. So he mm -hmm. looks and see. Yeah, he looks inside the the basement of the Pentagon, and and there's a guy across the way with a with his glasses on. And he's like, that's me. Yeah. yeah. He's, well, he's he's very human, and because then at he some is, point later yeah. on, he like he has to run to the bathroom, so he doesn't. He's got it, yeah. in front of everybody. Yeah, he's, you know, in, in some ways he's kind of a an unrepentant wimp. I mean, it's it's, you know, he is he's very good at what he does. He's clearly got a knack for kind of you know putting plans together. That's really, and he is the counterpart to uh, he is the the antagonist to to uh, our action man. So Tice right. really is is you know, and in some ways I think that's something else I've learned from writing is that if your protagonist and antagonist are exact equals, you kind of have a, a superhero novel. You know, you've got Mr. Bad versus Mr. Cape Crusader. I don't know that that's very exciting in a literary sense. I mean, it's great on the cinema screen, but I'd rather read where, you know, they're not equals really in capability and, and, and that kind of thing. I mean, Kol if you sat Tice in a room with Kolokov, Kolokov would run operational circles around Tice. He's a very smart man. He understands how to put the plan together. So in a lot of ways, it's Tice versus Kolokov's plan. Uh, but behind the scenes really is the mastermind that's Kolokov. And, and Tice is the one who has to fight the battles. But I don't know. I think we'd all rather read about a guy who's down on the ground shooting at things than someone who's, you know. And then he typed you know, another 16 <laughs> pages of the plan. <laughs> and, it, okay. and it worked and it happened. And it worked. Our troopers yeah. did this. Yeah. And <laughs> right. Another thing I found uh, interesting early on in the book is when the, the Russian soldiers are um, getting off the planes or the ships or wherever else they were getting. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Almost all of them were like, this is it? Like, 
Yeah. yeah they didn't, they're like, well, this is America. Yeah. yeah they, there's a, there's a scene I had where they get off in Dulles airport right. and it's kind of wintry and snowy out. It's, you know, the middle of December and, and, um, there's, there are three young officers who are with Kolokov. They're kind of bit parts, but they're a little bit foolish. And, and they're like, uh, where's the statue of Liberty? And they're like, <laughs> that's in Boston, man. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, uh, the way you ended things in Assault by Fire, it seems mm. that now Lieutenant Colonel Tice Asher. Yeah, uh, has whether he wanted it or not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Whether, yeah. I mean, surprise. <laughs> yeah. Um, he's got some more fighting to do. He's so got a lot more, yeah. Are we going to see a sequel next year? We will. So The Kill Box is the sequel. Uh, it's already, I'm in the middle of it. I'm, I'm past the middle. It's due in December, so I better be past the middle. Um, <laughs> But it's, uh, it is the sequel to this one. And, you know, I mean, I think as I've learned, the sequel is going to have a continuation of a lot of things, but it's going to be its own standalone. So you could pick that one up without having read this one, and you'll still be able to kind of run right along. But I'll, I'll keep the, the same characters. I did do in the kill box, I have introduced a new protagonist, and I've tested the protagonist out on a few test audiences. And they are so angry. They're like, you kill this person before the end of the book, right? And I'm like, the fact that you really want him dead means that it's a great protagonist. Because if you hate this person so badly because of their actions and what they do, then, then I'm, I'm doing okay. And it's working. Awesome. Hmm. Well, with 10,000 words a day, you probably oh my get gosh, yeah. done in like next week or something. Like <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I wish. I, I, it's, it's it's like that old adage: is you, you take three steps and then you take two steps back. So yeah, I yeah. I usually had, I told you about the seven chapters I eviscerated in the beginning. I mean, I've done that wholesale on this on the next one too. <laughs> It'll make just for a, a fantastic read like this yeah. was. Oh, you're you nice just to say sir, it. you just finished the traditional portion of our interview, and now yep. you're going to go into the happy part where we all talk. right. Silly, yeah. stupid stuff, and we hope you answer right. in a silly, stupid way. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm going to go first. What's the dumbest way you've injured yourself? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, let's see. I've broken a leg, a thumb, four ribs, <laughs> and three toes. Uh, my You're back and mess. <laughs> yeah. And my, and my nose five times. And so the dumbest way was I was reaching to pull my Kevlar helmet out of the overhead onboard ship for a, a disembarkation. We were attacking a beachhead. We were going to assault the beach. So I was pulling the gear. It was zero dark, whatever. And I hadn't had a full pot of coffee yet. And I dumped the helmet. The whole, my whole kit came down on me and the helmet landed on my nose. So I ran down to the the well deck uh, with this nose out of joint, crushed and bleeding, to make it onto the boat on time. And everyone's like, "What happened?" I'm like, um, "I think I just broke my nose." Never mind. <laughs> just pack it. I, I, yeah, no, that's right. I assaulted the beach. I mean, the corpsman came up. He put an ice pack. He had one of those, you know, ice packs that you just break the plastic and it yep. freezes and. And so I assaulted the beach with a with a broken nose. <laughs> well, Corman was excited. He actually had a real injury that he could actually. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. It was. I don't think he was too excited that his lieutenant was broken before he'd even hit the surf <laughs> the beach. Like we we hadn't even hit the the surf to get to the beach yet, and he was like, <laughs> "Sir, how dumb are you?" I'm like, "Well, Omar Bradley, you are not." <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, all right. Question two: If you could breed two animals together to yeah. defy the laws of nature, oh, what new animal would you create? <laughs> what new animal? Um, I mean, the wolverine already does that for us, doesn't he? I mean, it's, you know, if we're talking about red dawn, good, actually, if we're how can you make a wolverine animals, more more badass? That's what <laughs> I mean. Is that it's already so? So you know, God, the powers we've already had the animal hybrid, and it's the wolverine. It's that that little thing can. <laughs> Could kick some butt, so what, it doesn't get any better than that. Wolverines, Wolverines. Did you hear that, Sean? <laughs> Wolverines, <laughs> Wolverines. That's right. <laughs> uh, and here's my last one: Did you base any of the characters on uh, in Assault by Fire on Mark Rainey? No, um, 
Was there one in there that you thought was a Mark character? No, no I just we're, I, we're trying I wanted to get some inside scoop. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know that I don't know that Mark would forgive me if I did that. He'd be like, "Why am I in your book?" Um, uh, yeah, Don Bentley has a character whose name is Rawlings in the beginning of the book, and he and I, you know, have known each other for a year and some change. And I haven't asked him about that, but it's like it, the, the character is, you know, in his book is kind of a tough guy who uh, I think he's like a border control agent or something like that and he ends up in this wrestling match on the ground i'm like was that was that me <laughs> am, I, am i in your book don <laughs> so i don't know find it hey sean you're up yeah all right well on page 300 or so of assault by yeah. fire a marine named cameron is listed as one of the K kias yeah how, how do you die oh so you want to know exactly how how uh started first class or sorry uh, um you know, what, what was he? He was private uh, first class. Uh, Cameron was killed exactly yeah. or just his unit? I, I want to know how Cameron died. He's the only one. <laughs> Cameron, Cam right. So Cameron was was helping load mortars back in the mortar <laughs> zone and they sent him back to get another box and he tripped and the whole mortar, uh, the whole mortar box went up. And he, that that was was right. So there's okay. nothing left of him. <laughs> there's nothing nothing they found yeah they found they found his his boot up in a tree somewhere and and that's how they knew he had died mm. but it, it was not a big loss because he, he actually <laughs> he didn't yeah he he didn't drink coffee and he couldn't keep up with the rest of the guys very well so they're like yeah painful and and he was like what five foot two five foot two <laughs> <laughs> that's right it was a short qu question two is closely related. Are you planning oh, okay. to tell his story? <laughs> I think there's an audience for that. Yeah. Am I planning on telling uh, the the private uh, first class uh, Cameron story? Yeah, like, I think a novella would be. Would be I think it's already been told. He went up in a in a flash, and and that was it. And everyone's like, well, I guess we're down a few mortar rounds. And where's that kid, Cameron? <laughs> <laughs> He had no next of kin either. So. Okay. I, I, I think they value the mortar rounds more. They're like, oh, yeah, that was a big loss. Damn it, Cameron. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it. We needed those rounds, man. We needed those rounds. <laughs> all right. Well, my third question. Yeah. Assault by Fire is a terrific title. We all agree. Thanks. What guys. is your favorite book title? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I'm overly literary. So I, I, I like some of the titles for, you know, there's a lot of German novels that I've read. Uh, you know what I've gotten into is, have you seen the Babylon Berlin series or read the books yeah, I just by, started uh, watching it. by yeah, Kutcher? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, his name is Volker Kutcher. And the guy, right, it's, it's gumshoe stuff. So, if, you know, we're talking primarily, you know, military thriller stuff. So his is a different genre. But his is all kind of, um, you know, that, that almost film noir period you know where you have uh, like the big sleep or um mm -hmm. what am i thinking of uh, uh chinatown yeah. so it is it, it's fantastic stuff turned into an even better in my impression a miniseries on uh, sky one which is the german the european uh, channels so i watched that in german and i've read the books i've read his books in german i wrote him a a, a, a just a saying on Facebook and uh, never heard anything back, but I said great books, <laughs> but his books are, are kind of hard baked, hard boiled mystery series. So I think his what was Der Nasse Fisch is the German title, which means the wet fish. And I don't know, something about its title going along with the, the theme of the book is fantastic. And then Babylon Berlin, obviously is how they changed the title of the book, but very neat. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, let's see. On a scale of one to infinity, how's uh -oh. your hangover today? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, it's funny because um, my wife had to fly out early this morning and she drank all the caffeinated coffee in the hotel room. Damn so it. I went in to this morning like, oh my gosh, she left earlier than I did because her flight was there. She's, she's a doctor and she's practiced up in DC, so she had to get back quickly. But um, so I, I reached into the little cubby where they've got coffee and it was all those, you know, I mean, Guys who drink a lot of coffee, you can recognize a decaffeinated thing. So, you know, when you see green lettering on the front of any hotel coffees, you know immediately it's decaf. So I'm like, oh, decaf, oh, decaf, 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 decaf. Oh, no. <laughs> she stole all the caffeinated coffee. So. <laughs> if anybody doesn't so, know, um, um, Mark Graney, his, his uh, previous partner, got married last night. So it looked like a pretty good time. We had a fantastic time. Yeah, the all right. Was, was thrilling. Number two, 
what is the best food to eat for a hangover? Gator tacos, apparently. Because Gator tacos, <laughs> they yeah. work. <laughs> we're, here, we're here in Memphis and uh, staying, as I mentioned, at the Big Cypress Lodge, if you can see the sign back there. Yeah. What a neat place to stay. The, uh, they've served Gator tacos downstairs. They have a setup down there that looks like the bayou. There are, there's a swamp. There are, there are gar fish that are about 10 feet long. They have Jeez. alligators. They have um, fish feeding. And of course, you know, as all Bass Pro Shops do, they have these great stuffed animals all over and, and uh, in a fantastic shop and boats. I mean, guys that like to hunt and fish as I do. Um, I went bear hunting a few weeks ago. And so just looking at gear, I mean, some guys get into golf, I think, you know, and they like. Yeah, sure, sure. You know, yeah, they like the shoes that to tell, brag to their buddies. I get hey, man, I just driver. got the. Yeah, I just got a new putter or whatever. Yeah. But hunters get into that, you know, hunting gear and fishermen get into the bass boats. And so, you know, for me, walking around down there is amazing. So that, that was <laughs> part, of, that's part, part of my hangover cure is, is seeing all that stuff. <laughs> what can I get back in my suitcase? All right. Yeah, yeah. My last question is this. When, Mark, when, when watching Mark Graney dance, it's like yeah. watching blank. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> it's like watching Michael Jackson in his heyday. Mm. <laughs> Don't believe it. <laughs> no, you know what's funny is Mark, uh, my son was, so we got our kids down here and my son was the star of the dance floor. And Mark came over and was like, where did your kid get? I mean, he's got some moves. All the girls, you know how there's always a bevy of beauties at, at a wedding and yeah, Mark's, sure. uh, wedding, Mark's wedding to Alice. Alice is a beautiful lady. And, She's got all her friends there. And so there's a bevy of beauties out on the dance floor. In the middle of them is my, is my son, who's eight. And they're all <laughs> dancing with him. And they're like, your son is the greatest dancer. I'm like, he didn't, he didn't get it from me. Look at his mom. Because I can't dance at all. Kids so I know the better game. question would be, the better question wouldn't be, what did Mark look like on the dance floor? What did, what did Rip and Brad Taylor not look like? Brad uh, Taylor is here, by the way. So Brad Taylor yeah. is down, and yeah. he and I, we were telling uh, war stories. And boy, he's a what a great guy! I tell you, he's an amazing Perfect American guy. as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, we love the, him. The too. greatest thing about Brad is if you you know, if you read his books, you know how well he can write. Right. But then if you get to meet him in person, you realize he's lived ninety percent of this. He mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. he's just fun to talk to. I mean, he's had a lot of war experiences and a lot of just other experiences. So yeah. know, it was a neat, it was a neat conglomerate having me and Mark and, uh, and Brad and everybody together and our wives and kids and stuff. So I don't awesome. know, I, I got to keep an eye on my son. He apparently stole all the girls hearts last night. So <laughs> we got to keep, we got to watch out for this kid. I have one like that. I, um, we went to Boston and there was the street dancers were doing something and, and my youngest yeah. son could break dance and hip hop dance and all that stuff when he was like, oh, nice. Eight eight or nine too yeah. and so he ended up getting in a challenge with some 25 year old guy from canada oh my gosh and all the all the guys that were dancing started calling him white chocolate and they were like white chocolate wins white chocolate wins <laughs> white chocolate. Yeah. And, awesome. weddings and it, now he's he's 20 now or 19 now but uh but yeah all, all those years you can he still dance he, he's he, still he just, a pretty good dancer he's still yeah he's still a great dancer he just doesn't do yeah. it like he used to <laughs> I, at what stage at some stage you grow out of that i think at some stage you know you're you're not as good <laughs> maybe it's 13 yeah well yeah 13 once you hit yeah you get a little gawky it's definitely I think in your 40s too <laughs> with definitely yeah it's definitely in your 40s i think there's a there's a period in your life where you just don't care at, at that age and you get on the dance floor and like i can go i'm i'm having the time of life and everybody loves me you know and then you get like in your 20s and you're like I look like a moron. I need to get off the dance floor. <laughs> Some of us stayed that way the whole way through. That's right. Yep. I'm one of them. <laughs> well, Rip, you're uh, once again, dude, you're an awesome guest. You're uh, an you awesome writer. Great. Thanks uh, for having me. So Assault by Fire, Cheers, not yes, only sir. is it is it technically cool, but it's a really fun read, dude. I love oh, reading this book. I appreciate yeah, it, guys. This was fantastic writing. And it, it, you wouldn't know that this was your – personal debut you know oh, hell no. as an no, individual no, thanks, writer yeah. this reads like somebody that's been doing it for like 10 15 books easy well i, I got a lot of a lot more roads ahead but uh it was a pleasure to write and it's a lot of fun and I'm, I'm excited to keep going on with the series i mean i i pitch again in december to uh we'll see who i pitch to but we're going to pitch another series in december so i'm going to keep this one going uh we've got red metal 2 coming out in less than 18 months 
Oh, and really? then uh, I've got another series that we're going to throw up and see what happens. Dude, this you are uh, – This was my favorite read of 2020 right there. Oh, Mike, you're the man. I appreciate that, guys. Seriously. Dude, you're awesome, Rip. We're going to raise a glass. Cheers to you guys. Thanks, Thanks to the crew. You, pal. Thanks, fellas. Absolutely. Guys, Rip yes. Rawlings, um, retired Lieutenant Colonel Marine Corps. Yes. On our show. He is, it was our, his second time or third time on the show? Third time. Third, third, third time. He did our Fourth of July show with us. Yeah. But he's got a new book coming out, Assault by Fire. We talked about it during the interview. Mm-hmm. Awesome book. If you like Red Dawn, if you like Red Metal, which he wrote with Mark Rainey, you're going to love this book. Um, I want to thank Rip for coming on the show. Mm-hmm. Thank Sean and Mike for being awesome co-hosts. I want everybody to tune in next Monday for another awesome interview on the crew reviews. Don't cry on page 300. Mm.